Hello brothers and sisters in Christ, if you can open up, get out your King James Bibles and open up to Revelation chapter 1 verse 8. Chapter 1 verse 8. I was going to do a quick like 5 to 10 minute study and like normal, I love the Word of God. I start getting into the Word of God and a 5 to 10 minute study ends up blowing up to a 30 minute to an hour study. So. Please get your King James Bibles out and please follow along. And the title of this was just going to be If There's a Beginning, There's an End, right? And I was going to talk about the beginning of wisdom again, is the fear of the Lord. And, the, and we are going to touch on that. And the end of wisdom is keeping His commandments. But then God started having me go through this thing and start talking. We start getting into what God, what God says in His Word about beginnings versus ends. Okay. And that says, this isn't a hardcore study. I, I got to stop myself before it got too long. So we're going to start in Revelation chapter 8, verse, or Revelation chapter 1, verse 8. Okay. And the point of this study is, if there is a beginning, then there is an end. We're going to learn that in this study. And which one is most important, beginning or the end? And if one's more important than the other, does that mean the other's not important at all? Remember... 2 Timothy 2.15, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. What does God's word say? So let's get into this. First, let's start with God. The one person, the Godhead, the person, you know, Jesus, the, the capital S Son of God, the body of God, the Spirit of God, God is the Spirit, the Holy Spirit of God, and you have God the Father, which is the soul of God, body, soul, spirit, Remember what the, just going off a little bit, remember what a person is, brother, says Christ, according to the Bible, Bible definition of a person, they have a body, they have a soul, and they're always referred to as someone who's living. So the Godhead, okay, is the only thing that didn't have a beginning and doesn't have an end. And we're going to learn that here, okay? Revelation chapter 1, verse 8. Revelation chapter 1, verse 8. Okay, go over one more page. I, talk about God, Almighty, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord. Notice it's a capital L, lowercase o-r-d. Remember 1 Corinthians 8, 6, there's only one capital L, lowercase o-r-d, Jesus Christ. One capital G, God, the Father. They're one and the same. This is the Godhead. Even though it says I, singular, one person, the Godhead, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is which was, and which is to come, the Almighty. Hmm. Turn to Revelations 21.6. Revelation 21.6. Towards the end. And he, sa and he said unto me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I'll give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. What we're looking for here is I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. God was there before the beginning. He'll be there long after the end. He's eternal. Right. Drop down to, or turn over to another, the next chapter, Revelation 22, 13. What do we read? I am Alpha and Omega. The beginning and the end, the first and the last. You say, why would you go over it three times? Three times in the Bible. Remember we talked about, Brother Jesus Christ, when the Bible says something more than once, it's really emphasizing how important it is. Remember in the Gospels where it says, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. It's mentioned three times out of the four Gospels. Three times. When God repeats himself time and time again, it's because it's very important. God is eternal. The Godhead is eternal. The Bible says uh, in first John, uh, John chapter 1, in the beginning was the Word, talking about Jesus Christ, the body of God, the Son of God. There was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. You get over in Genesis, you read about how the Holy Spirit's hovering over the water in the beginning. You have the Holy Spirit there, you have God the Father there, you have the Son of God, the Word, the capital W Word. They were there at the beginning. 
Bible talks about how Jesus created all things, you know. I'll praise thy name. Oh, no, that's another verse. Um, but it talks about how he created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created, and Jesus created all things. Then it talks about how God created all things. Then it says Jesus created all things. They're one and the same. They're the same person. Okay. Singular. So that part's eternal. I wanted to get that really quick and out of the way. All right. But we're going to be talking about, he talks about how he was there at the very beginning, before the beginning. He is the beginning. He was there, he's going to be there way after the end. He is the end. He's eternal. Turn to Ecclesiastes, the book of the preacher. Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes chapter 3. Oops. I need to learn to turn better, turn pages better. Because um, I think I'm there, <laughs> and I'm like, I'm, I kind of went way too far back, or way too far forward. So forgive me, brothers of Christ. Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 11. He hath made everything beautiful in his time. Remember, <coughs> forgive me, <coughs> the Lord, Jesus Christ, who is God the Father, manifest in the flesh, created all things. And you learn in the Bible that be quickened by the Spirit, right? The Holy Spirit's what makes things alive, okay? So the Godhead created all things in the Bible. He hath made everything beautiful in His time. Also, He hath set the world in their heart, so that no man can find out the work that God maketh from the beginning to the end. There's a beginning, there's going to be an end. If there's an end, there had to have been a beginning. You see how that works? And we're really going to hammer this home. Uh, Ecclesiastes, back up to Ecclesiastes 3, stamp chapter 3, but go to verse 1. To everything there is a season. This is what they're talking about when we read there, the work of the, that God maketh from the beginning to the end. To everything there is a season, and a time to every purpose under heaven. A time to be born, beginning. That's our beginning. When we're born, that's our beginning. God created us when we were born. And a time to die, that's our end. Now today, brothers and sisters of Christ, our end is we get caught up in life. I call it getting caught up in life, or we get caught up in death. But the world as a whole, everyone that's born is going to die. Unless you get saved and born again, and you get to see that blessed hope, the day of Christ, the catching away of the body of Christ before the time of Jacob's trouble. Okay. But not naturally, when something's born, it dies. There's a time to be born, there's a time to die. I got some baby chicks right now, and they hatched them from eggs. They were born. They're going to grow up. They're going to get back in with the rest of my hens, and the elderly hens are going to die. Uh, it's just there's a beginning and there's an end. Well, which one's important? We'll get to that. A time to plant and a time to pluck up. I got my garden. They're starting to sell the plants. I got the seeds. And I got to go through and get everything ready and plant everything. There's a time to plant. That's right now. We're getting into spring. Now's the time to plant. Come the end of summer, when everything's big, it's lush, it's ready to go. Uh, it's time to, what it says here, and it's a time, and, there, and a time to pluck up that which is planted. It's time to plant. Beginning. A time to pluck up that which is planted, end. You know, a good thing here is we go out and we preach the gospel, brother, sis, Christ, and we plant seeds. There's a time to plant. We're planting seeds, trying to lead people to Jesus Christ with the true plan of salvation. Got another study over here. I had a question from a brother in Christ. You know, can a lost person, or can a saved person who once stood for the gospel somehow turn against the gospel. You know, talking about the falling away. How great is the falling away? How far can people fall and st that are truly saved? And how do you look at people that look like they're trying to look like they're fallen, but they're false converts. They were never saved to begin with. 
How do you distinguish between the two? We're going to get into that. But right now, brothers of Christ, we're planting seeds with the true plan of salvation. Repentance towards God, faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, confess both in prayer, and ask God to save you. And after God saves you, because you threw the old man at the foot of the cross, you gave your life to Jesus Christ at Calvary, the cross, God gives you a new life, a new birth, the changed life, the new creature in Christ Jesus. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. We preach the true plan of Jesus Christ. The true plan of salvation through our Lord, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We plant seeds. Some of those seeds grow. Some of those seeds just get plucked up. By, you, you can read about the parable of the sower. Go ahead. But then there comes a time to pluck up that which is planted. God's going to call us home. Those where the seeds fell on good ground and grow heartily, people who get saved and born again, there's a time where He's going to call us home, brothers and Christ. Don't forget that this life is not it. This life isn't the end. Okay? We got born, that's the beginning. We plant seeds, we get saved, that's the middle. We start living a life of Christ, that's the middle. Our end is up there. Our eternity is up there, brothers and sisters of Christ. And some of the brethren forget that. But the important part here is there's a time to be born. It's the beginning. There's a time to die, end. A time to, be, to plant, beginning. And a time to pluck up that which is planted. And you read Ecclesiastes. I love the preacher, the book of the preacher. You know, uh, Ecclesiastes, you skip. To everything there is a season. To everything, there's a season. And it goes through. There's a start. There's a finish. There's a beginning. There's an end. Okay? Now, what is better? Beginning or the end? Ecclesiastes 7, 8. Turn to Ecclesiastes 7, chapter, eight. chapter 7, verse 8. Chapter 7, verse 8. What does it say? It says, Better is the end of all things. Not how you start out, it's how you end. Better is the end of all things than the beginning thereof. And the patient in spirit is better than the proud in spirit. Hmm. I know it says patience, but I'm talking about the, when it hits proud in spirit. What keeps people from getting saved today? The pride of life. The love of sin. That proud, remember you read uh, the parable that Jesus speaks of where you have the publican and you have the Pharisee. And that Pharisee is very proud, you know, a proud in spirit. And then you have the publican that's humble. I know this says spirit, but it just reminds me that it's like humble. He's humble in spirit. And he just, God be merciful to me, a sinner. Better is the end of things than the beginning thereof. For this, what we're talking about, Brother Strike, the best thing is the salvation, getting saved, getting born again. Where you started doesn't matter as much as where you're going to end up. I started out as a dirty, rotty, rotten, filthy, low-down, no-good sinner on my way to hell. That was going to be my end. And then the lake of fire. <clears throat> I had sinned against God. I loved sin. I loved the world. I was, very, I was carnally minded, walking after the flesh, Romans chapter 8 carnally minded, walking after the flesh, that was my beginning. But what matters more? The end. God broke me. I came to Him in a broken and contrite, a broken heart. God saves such of a broken heart and saves such, uh, you know, He's near to those of a broken heart and saves such that of a, a contrite spirit. I came to Him in repentance. I threw the old man at the foot of the cross. Okay. Now, now, my sins are washed away. I'm no, my destination is no longer hell. It's no longer the lake of fire. My destination is up there. And I've said this in past videos. I first started out when I got saved saying, Hey, you know, if I, if I get to wash the feet of the saints and I just get a penny, I'm just so grateful. And that's how most people are. That's how we should be, brothers and sisters Christ. When you first get saved, I'm just so grateful to be let in because I don't deserve it. I'm worth worthless. I'm not worthy. I'm of the dirt of the ground, Lord. 
I, I, I abhor myself in dust and ashes. You read that in the book of Job. I abhor myself. He did wrong by God, and he said, I abhor myself in dust and ashes. I don't deserve to go there. And my attitude was, you know, if I get a penny, you know, if I get to wash the feet of the saints at the, at the entry in and exiting of the city, praise God. He, he let me in. Praise God. But then you start studying the Word of God and start hiding God's Word in your heart. Remember the Bible says, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way by taking heed thereto according to thy word. The Bible starts talking about how you're supposed to live a life of Christ. You're supposed to please God. And then you start reading some more and you read about the judgment seat of Christ. How every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess, so that then every one of us shall give an account of himself to God. We're still going to have to give an account of ourselves, brothers, says Christ, in this life to God at the judgment seat of Christ, and there's going to be some rewards. This isn't the end. And as we're down here, brothers of Christ, we're supposed to aspire to more, doing more for the Lord, living for the Lord, sanctification, wisdom. Remember the beginning of wisdom, we'll get into a little bit more later, but the beginning of wisdom, and then there's an end to wisdom. Okay? Sanctification, there's a beginning to sanctification, and there's an end to sanctification. What's the beginning of sanctification? In this life, we need to start hiding God's Word in our heart and getting the evil and wickedness out of our heart. We need to start getting the bad things out of our life. Abstain from all appearance of evil, put no wicked thing before thine eyes. Avoid fornication. Avoid wickedness. Satanism. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> so many things the Bible talks about. That's the beginning of sanctification. God saved us, gave us a new life, and now God's going to start cleaning up our life. What's the end of sanctification? Someday, someday, we're going to, we, either in death we're going to get caught up, or in life, but everybody, because the Bible says the dead in Christ rise first, we're going to give an incorruptible body, and we're going to be completely redeemed and fully sanctified someday. That's the end. We're going to have incorruptible bodies, we're no longer going to have to struggle. This flesh will be in unison with our soul. It will no longer be, go, be and always being contrary to our soul. Our soul says, Lord, we love you. And our spirit says, we love you, Lord. We want to do things your way. And our flesh is always like, no, we want to do that. No, we want to do that. Your flesh is always against you. But when that day comes, we're going to get an incorruptible body. And that body of flesh will have the same mind as our soul. We'll all be in unison. Our flesh will be like, I want to please God, and I'm going to do things God's way. But that's not our flesh today. Brothers is Christ, if you're honest, you can say amen to that. We struggle with the flesh today. Okay? But the end, by here it says, better is the end of all things than the beginning thereof. So the end, we're learning, is better than the beginning. Some people think, well, God can't save me. I'm just too bad. I've gone too far. I've done too many bad things. The whole point that we just talked about in a previous study <clears throat> about Paul, when he said he's the chiefest of sinners, he's talking about at salvation, not as a saved sinner, not as a servant of Jesus Christ, not living for Jesus Christ, looking for that blessed hope every day with the life that he's living, being a living witness and a verbal witness. No, he's talking about at salvation, he's the chiefest of sinners. And what he's saying is, is, no matter how bad you think you are, I'm worse. Brothers and Christ, I'm here to tell you, no matter how bad I mean, you think you are, that's what you tell the lost world. I didn't mean to aim it at you, Brothers and Christ, but I'm talking to you. The lost world comes to us, no matter how bad you look at them, no matter how bad you think you are, I'm worse. You think you've fallen so far, too far, I'm worse. But here's the thing, God saved me. Paul's sitting there going, but God saved me. And if God could save a dirty, rotten, filthy, low-down, no-good sinner, chiefest of sinners, oh, wretched man that I am, who should deliver me from this body of death? If God can save someone like me, He can save you. The end is better. The better is the end of all things than the beginning. What matters is salvation. What matters is live, once you get saved, when it comes to, we're going to get, I'm getting ahead of myself, but it's going to talk about someone who's dead but is now alive, who was lost but now is found. Now that we're found, we start a whole new beginning, living a life of Christ. And now the end, we need to be focused on the end. We need to be focused on looking for that blessed hope. We need to be focused, brothers and sisters Christ, on that blessed hope. 
getting gospel tracts out, getting Bibles to people who want Bibles, helping brethren with food and raiment, preaching the word, be an instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. We need to exhort one another. We need to encourage one another to stand true to this word and keep our eyes on Jesus Christ no matter what's going on in the world. Everything right now, brothers and Christ, everything that's going on in the world, it's happened before. There's nothing new under the sun. But everyone's acting like, ooh, this time is different. And ooh, ooh, ooh. And they get so distracted by it. Oh, the, this might be the catching away here. And, and this might be this. And this, ooh, ooh, ooh. There's nothing new under the sun. Could we get caught up soon? I believe we will. I'm always looking for the blessed hope. And so should you, brother, says Christ. But if God says, no, I'm not ready yet, and we go through World War III, that's no different than World War II, World War I, all the millions of wars, that, I say millions, but hundreds, probably tens of thousands of wars that have happened since Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. People say, well, this is going to happen. This is going to... God's got everything under control. Our focus... It's supposed to be on our end, which is that blessed hope. Us dying and going to heaven, or us getting caught up in life going to heaven. We need to be focused on Jesus Christ. We need to keep our eyes on Jesus Christ. Okay. So we read here, better is the end of all things than the beginning. Now stop. But some, like easy believism, will have you believe the beginning doesn't matter at all. And sometimes some of the brethren have gotten into this, well, the beginning doesn't matter at all. Really? Is that what the Bible says? Once you get saved, the beginning doesn't matter. Isaiah 46.10. Isaiah 46.10. Turn to Isaiah 46.10. Isaiah 46.10. Now, if you know anything about testimonies, you already know that's not true. But I was deceived in the Babel building system when I was a false convert, easy believism. Oh, your past is completely erased and means nothing. Just ignore it, act like it doesn't exist, and just you know continue living today. Just but but to, but you live the same as you did as the, as the past. Nothing changed. There's no repentance. There's no cr new creature in Christ Jesus. They're using Bible perversions. Nothing changed, but that we get told that you know the past is the past. But just ignore it. Act like it didn't happen. Is that what the Bible preaches and teaches? Okay. Isaiah 46.10 Declaring the end from the beginning. We'll explain that a little bit more. And from ancient times, the things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall not stand, I will do all my pleasures. Declaring the end from the beginning. And from ancient times, the things that are not yet done. Now this is prophecy. You read prophecy in Isaiah prophesying Jesus Christ, the time of Jacob's trouble, you know, the, the, day, the day of the Lord, the kingdom of heaven, the thousand year reign of Jesus Christ. Okay? But we read in the New Testament on how the gospel, it always says it's, it's preordained, it's preordained. What's it talking about? The end is declared from the beginning. From the very beginning, God provide, was planning a way for us to get saved. It's not Calvinism. Calvinism is, is wrong. Anybody can get saved today. God's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But they come to those verses and say, oh, you're either destined to be saved or not. No. It's saying that from the very beginning, since the fall of Satan, you know, that cherub, he's not an angel, he's a cherub, that fallen cherub, and he, got at, he deceived Eve, and Adam chose to die with Eve, the fall of man, God had a plan to save all mankind. He had a plan. Declaring the end from the beginning. Uh, the book of uh, Hebrews says, Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. God planned to send his son to be the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. Remember John the Baptist sees him and says, Behold, the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. He had it all planned out. Declaring the end from the beginning. When we give a testimony, brothers and Christ, what's our testimony? We start at the beginning. Who we are today, the end, is defined by the beginning in the sense that we had to come to God as a, we, sh we talk about our, our lost life. We talk about that dirty, rotten, filthy, low-down, no-good sinner. Paul talks about being the chiefest of sinners. O wretched man that I am. There's none righteous, no, not one. There's none that understandeth. There's none that seeketh after God. They've all be together become unprofitable. There's none that doeth good, no, not one. 
For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We talk about our, our filthiness and how we're on our way to hell. We were on our way to hell. We talk about our lost state and our testimony. We talk about how God broke us. We finally came to Him. The world was just... my. You, there's something was just wrong with the world. There's something wrong with me. I'm, I'm starting to get to the point where I'm just... I'm starting to have a problem with sin. I don't like sin. I hate sin. And evidently I'm sinning against somebody. And then you realize you sin against God, your, your creator. And that sorrow starts building up. And you talk about how you came to God broken. You fell down on your knees and said, Lord, I am a dirty, rotten, filthy, low down, no good sinner. I'm the chiefest of sinners, a wretched man that I am. Who will deliver me from this death? Lord, I'm on my way to hell and I deserve to go. You give your testimony. And your testimony starts at the beginning. How many of you heard testimonies where it's just, I believe, head knowledge. They have the knowledge of what Jesus did. And they have the knowledge of why Jesus did it. But they're still on their way to hell. You've, these testimonies of, oh, I just believed and I'm saved. Uh, that's not a testimony. That's, 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 that's indoctrination. That's promoting a false gospel. What happened to the beginning? They skipped the beginning. And they go straight to the end. That's not a good testimony. A good testimony starts at the beginning and the, the end. Here, declaring the end from the beginning. Why did you get saved? Because I was like this, the beginning, and now I'm like this, the end. We're going to get into this a little bit more. Um, Luke 15, 12. Turn to Luke 15, 12. I'm really turning into a lot of these this time. <laughs> but Luke 15, 12. Usually don't, I want to keep this quick, short. But Luke 15, 12. I mean, you turn, pause the video and turn. But I try to, to read off my notes to keep, keep it going. But Luke 15, 12. Now this is a parable that Jesus is putting forth about two sons and their father. Let's read this. Luke 15, 12. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. And he divided unto them his living. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country, and there wasted his substance with righteous living. And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in the land. And he began to be in want. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into the fields to feed swine. And he would fain have filled his belly with the husk that the swines did eat, and no man have gave unto him. And when he came to himself, he said, we're going to stop there. This is his beginning. People say, oh no, he started out with his father. When you're raising children, brothers and sisters of Christ, you raise them in the admonition of the Lord. You teach them what God says is right and what God says is wrong, and it's what God that matters. Because when you teach them what's right and what's wrong according to God, and any time you do wrong, you've sinned against God, that's what you teach them. That's raising them in the admonition of the Lord. Not cramming the gospel down their throat at two, three, four, five years old. Teaching them what God says is right and wrong, what sin against God is, and then when they get older, they go out into the world. And that's what this picture of this man is. Someone who's going out into the world. And he gets lost for a while. Okay. But that's how someone who grows up, they see how wicked they are. I tried to keep the, the I tried to do what's right by God. I tried to do what's right. And I still failed them left and right. It's how they sense their need for the Savior. Today you're getting a lot of children that are indoctrinated by having the gospel crammed down their throat and oh they got saved at four or five years old and when they get older they end up how do, why do they always a lot of them end up atheists a lot of them end up joining a, a different let's say that they, the Bible buildings that claim that they believe the King James Bible they cram down the throats of these children and they grow up to be Mormons Jehovah's Witness Catholics most of them atheists but they got saved at four or five years old. No, you should have been preaching more on sin, what sin is, and that thus saith the Lord. God's the, the foundation of what's right and wrong. We do this because God says so. 
We don't have anything to do with that because God says not to have anything to do with that. You make God the foundation. You make God, that's what's raising him in the admonition of the Lord. God is the boss. God is the final authority. That's what you teach him. And then when they grow up, a lot of them will get saved. When they're raised in the admonition of the Lord, not guaranteed, they can still go out to the world and get lost in the world and the world can swallow them up. Okay. But this is his beginning. Once he goes out to the world, he gets to the age of accountability. It's a, a sign of someone who gets to the age of accountability. He goes out to the world. He wants to do his own thing. That's his beginning. Let's keep going here. How many hired servants of my father have bread enough to spare? And I perish with hunger. I will arise and go to my father, and I will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee. Remember, this is a parable, but this is repentance. He's, he has a, he's talking. Look how he's talking there. How how my servants, life was better when I was, was with God instead of against God. Remember, this is, you know, this is still in the Old Testament, preaching the kingdom of heaven. My life was better when I was with God than against God. And today we obey the, the number one command is obey the gospel. You want to be with God, you obey the gospel. That's how you're with God today. You want to be against God, reject the true plan of salvation. Go for a false gospel. Or just become an atheist, okay? You go against God. I'll write and say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee. There's sorrow there. He's coming of a broken heart and a contrite spirit. Verse 19, And I am no more worthy to be called thy son. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Remember that publican. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. He doesn't justify himself. Well, I tried something. It just didn't work out, Dad. you got to take me back. You know, I'm your son, after all. You have to take me back. No, that wasn't his attitude. I'm no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And his son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven. He said unto him. The reason I'm making these points, brothers, is Christ, that they take repentance out of the plan of salvation. They take prayer out of the plan of salvation. They take asking God to save them out of the plan of salvation. Now, he's, they, they make it all just a head thing. You think it, you're good. It's a heart issue. Now, the abundance of the mouth, the heart speaks. The son didn't just think it in his heart. He actually said it to his father. Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight and am no more worthy to be called thy son. But the father said to his servants, Bring forth the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. And bring hither the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and be merry. Why? Verse 24. For this my son was dead beginning, and is alive, be the end. He was lost, beginning, and is found. And they began to be married. Now, why tell us the beginning? If the beginning doesn't matter, we just read Luke 15, he starts the parable from the very beginning. Would we read in Isaiah 46, declaring the end from the beginning? You can't understand the end if you don't understand the beginning. What was his beginning? He was dead. What was our beginning, brothers and Christ? We were dead in trespasses and sins. Getting a little ahead of myself. The start is important, but the end is even more important. The start is not just, okay, we erase it, it's not important anymore. It's, imp it's important. But the end is more important. He's alive. He's found. That's more important than the beginning. But the beginning is still important. Better is the end of all things than the beginning thereof. At the start, he was dead. At the end, he is alive. Ephesians 2, chapter 2, verse 1, it says, And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. Quickened, that's the end, the beginning. You were dead in trespasses and sin. And you, uh, Colossians 2.13, and you being dead 
and your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh hath he quickened. Quickened means made alive. Has he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespass. Remember it said at the start he was lost. 2 Corinthians 4.3 But the gospel be hid, it's hid to them that are lost. People who don't want to obey the gospel. There was a time where I was lost. I asked the Lord sometimes, I was like, Lord, did you ever try to, you know, because the Lord knows your heart, but I go back to my life when I was lost. Sometimes, how many of us do this? Maybe I'm the only one. But how many sit there and talk with the Lord and say, Lord, there's times I wish I had gotten saved sooner. I wish I had gotten saved sooner and avoided a lot of mistakes. I had gotten saved sooner and didn't get into sin and wickedness and worldliness as much as I did. How many of us do that? And I talk with the Lord and I say, well, you know, the gospel be hid, it's hid to them, they're lost. I was too worldly. I was too into the world. I was too carnally, I was carnally minded, walking after the flesh. I was so, God hit me at, at multiple times. I look back, there was times where God hit me and I just kind of like, oh, and went back to doing my thing. But there came a time where when God hit me, in other words, when I say hit me, broke us, and we had hard things in our life, it was a smack in the face, whatever life really was, wickedness and sin, we're on our way to hell. God did that to me a lot, and I just ignored it and went back on my way. But there was a time when God really hit me that I came to Him broken, and my life has never been the same since. But our gospel be hid, it's hid to them that are lost. Philippians 3.9 says, And be found in Him. We're supposed to be, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away, behold, all things have become new. We're supposed to be separate from the world. Love not the world. Right. Love not the world, any things in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove, prove, be found in him. Prove. What is that good? Uh, perfect will of God. Okay. And be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law. In other words, you're, you're keeping the holy days, the Sabbath days, a new moon. You're getting circumcised. That's the law. You're the touch not, taste not, eat not, and so on. So you're trying to obey the law for salvation. No, we came to Jesus Christ. Now that we're saved, we're in Christ Jesus. God tells us how to live and we live it. Or we do our best. Sometimes we fail. But God will get us back up on our feet. But the whole point, our life now is for Him and we try our best to live His way. And the enemy comes in and tries to say, oh no, that's work salvation, that's work salvation. No, when it talks about the law here, it's talking about keeping the Levitical laws of the Old Testament in order to be saved. Circumcision. Okay? The holy days, Sabbath days, and new moon. The touch not, taste not, eat not. It's not talking about, hey, I'm abstaining from all appearance of evil, not because I'm trying to earn salvation, but because I belong to God, and God commanded me to abstain from all appearance of evil. Therefore, I'm because of my love for God, and because I belong to God, because I am in Christ Jesus our Lord, I want to do my best to abstain from all appearance of evil. This wicked world, if our gospel be hid, it's hid to them that are lost. No, no, that's works. That's what you're just trying to earn salvation. No, because they don't want to come to God broken. They don't want God to be the boss. They don't want God to be the final authority in their life. They still like to be their own lowercase g God. Remember what Satan promised Eve. Ye can be as gods, knowing good and evil. Ye can be as gods. You can make the decision on what's right and wrong. You can make the decision on what you want to do and what you don't want to do. You're the foundation. That's this easy believism. That's this world. You're the foundation. Not God. We come along and say, God is the foundation. And you're going to get tacked left and right. And be found in Him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ. The righteousness which is of, the, of God by faith. The finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. Why did Jesus die on the cross? He died for our sins. Repentance. You come to Him broken. You believe in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. Confess both in prayer and you ask God to save Him. 
I was once lost. The gospel be hid, it's hid to them that are lost. But now I am found. My beginning, lost. My end, I'm found. But this is Christ, there's a beginning and there's an end. The beginning's important, but the end is more important. You have to come to a point like I did, and you did, brothers and Christ, if you're watching this, I pray you did, that you're saved and born again. You didn't get caught up in some organized religion you're watching because it's part of organized religion. No, no. That your life belongs to Jesus Christ. And it's His way. At some point, you started out lost. And you became found. You were dead in trespasses and sins. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. You got saved and you were quickened, made alive. And here we get to the beginning of wisdom. There's a, everything that has a beginning has an end. And this is what a lot of people don't like. This is what I mainly wanted to talk about, but God started putting on my heart. Let's talk about beginning and end, period. Psalms 111.10. And I'm not turning anymore because I'm trying to get through this. Brother. Psalms 111.10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. What's the beginning? Fear. Fearing God. You raise your children in the admonition of the Lord saying, this is what God says is right, this is what God says is wrong. And someday down the road, they start getting the fear of God because they look at their life and say, wait a minute, I'm doing what's wrong by God. I'm sinning against God. I'm going against everything my parents taught me that God says is right, and I'm doing things that are wrong. It starts with fearing God. That's where wisdom truly starts, fearing God. And it says, a good understanding have all they that do his commandments. That's the end of wisdom. Who's your final authority? Are you your own final authority? The clubhouse you like to go to called a church building. I call them Babel buildings. Church buildings. Respecter of persons. You're part of a club. Part of organized religion. I got a book over here I got that has verses on here, but I, I've been doing some studying and talking with some brethren about different religions where they put out a book and then they tell you, see this book? Yes, it's nice and all, but then they have a whole encyclopedia of books where they tell you what this means and just a whole encyclopedia of books and everything that they say basically goes against the book. And it's like, this is the final authority. Is God the final authority, or is mankind the final authority? Now, don't get me wrong. I have Peter Ruckman's expository books. I have some expository books up there from other men that are way back in the past. Don't even know who they are. All right? It just has their name, and they give you their two cents on the Bible. Mm -hmm. There's nothing wrong with reading an expository book to a point, but this is still the foundation, not those expository books. The Word of God is the final authority. Okay. It starts with fearing God. That's the start of wisdom, the beginning. And the end is doing His commandments. And I still get attacked so much. And it ends this saying, His praise endures forever. Praise God for this. Why, isn't the, why am I getting attacked a lot by easy believism? The faith alone crowd that take out repentance and they even take out prayer most of the time. They just have the knowledge of what Jesus Christ went through and why he went through it. But they've never come to him with a, broke, with a broken heart and a contrite spirit. They've never confessed both in prayer and asked God to save them. Some have, but some, most of them haven't. They get on to me and they attack me over this. His praise endures for it. We praise God for this. But remember what we read. The end is, is better than the beginning. Doing his commandments. If you're doing His commandments, you don't have to fear God as much. You still need to fear Him, but you're not sitting there in constant fear if you're doing His commandments. Remember, as a little child, as long as you're obeying your mother and father, you don't have fear of, of, of punishment or reprisal from your father if you're doing what He's telling you to do. When does that fear really sink in? When you're not doing what He told you to do. Or you're doing what He told you not to do. Then that fear really comes in. Remember we read there that the end is defined by the beginning. 
What's the evidence that people actually fear God? Brothers and Christ, the fear of the Lord today, even among the body of Christ, that fear isn't hardly there that much anymore. We seriously have a problem with actually fearing God because a lot of us aren't doing things God's way. We think we can be an internet Christian or this world has just gotten so bad so now God understands if we don't do things His way and we don't live a life of Christ exactly because you know the world's getting wicked and we... No, we are not to conform to the world. Remember the verse we just read? Be not conformed to this world. But a lot of us are starting to compromise this to get along with the world. The end is defined by the beginning. If you truly fear God, you're going to keep His commandments. If you're keeping His commandments, it's because you fear God. His commandments, not your made-up commandments. A lot of false religions out there, they're made-up commandments where they have their own ordinances, their own... Uh, the Old Testament you have... or not the Old Testament... In Acts, the book of Acts, and all through the Pauline epistles, you have Jews coming in trying to get the people that are saved, the body of Christ, back under the Levitical laws to be saved. And today, the equivalent of that today is the Catholic Church and her daughters. Mystery Babylon, the mother of harlots, and her daughters, where they have their own, they make up their own ordinances and their own, you know, Levit their, I say their, their own so-called Levitical laws, their own laws, their own rules, and everything that's contrary to this, and they get you back under that in order to be saved. Uh -huh. The beginning of wisdom is fearing God and doing His commandments. Right here. What's His commands for today? Well, how, how many of you are, really know the Pauline epistles? I come across, when I was newly saved, uh, I came across people that I used to, you know, hang out with, I used to call it fellowship, but now I know better, socializing and hanging out with in battle buildings, they really love quoting verses from, from the, the Gospels, or they'll run all the way back to Psalms and Proverbs. And I'm not saying it's wrong to quote those, but when you ask them, how much of the Pauline Epistles do you actually know? They didn't hardly know anything about the Pauline Epistles. You don't know about the commands that Paul is the apostle to the Gentiles, and you don't know the commands that are given to us on how to live a life of Christ today? What pleases the Lord today with salvation, when it comes to ministry, when it comes to being a bannister for Jesus Christ? Now, instruction in righteousness all throughout the Bible on how to please God and, and live right to a point. But Paul talks a lot about the instruction in righteousness you get elsewhere. He talks about it. People say, well, you're a, Paul, you're a Paulinian and everything. No, I don't ignore the whole Bible. We just got finished going through the whole Bible. I love the whole Bible. But the Pauline epistles is Paul's the apostle to the Gentiles. The gospel that we get saved off was revealed to Paul to the Gentiles. And people attack the true plan of salvation. Oh, uh, the Romans rode to hell. You know, They attack the true plan of salvation that Paul is with, preaching to us. And a lot of people try to grow back to the gospels. And I'm telling you right now, a lot of the times it's talking about gospel and the gospels. It's talking about the kingdom of heaven, the gospel of the kingdom of heaven. That's only for the Jews when salvation is of the Jews. That's not for us today. Right? But I digress. The beginning of wisdom, back to the topic. Sorry, Brother Jesus Christ, back to the topic. The beginning of wisdom is fearing the Lord. That's the beginning. What's the end? And all they that do His commandments. Proverbs 1.7 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. But fools despise wisdom and instruction. Their end says they don't like the beginning. They're against the beginning. Proverbs 9.10 The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the holy is understanding. Do you know people who actually fear God? God opens the scriptures to them and teaches them how to please Him and do what's right by Him. And they start getting understanding. The end. Beginning, fear of the Lord. The end, they start getting understanding. They start learning how to keep what, what God's commands are, and then you start keeping them. The end of wisdom, do His commandments. All right. End of wisdom, do His commandments. Revelation 4.11 says, Thou art worthy, O Lord. Revelation 4.11. Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for Thou hast created all things, and for Thy pleasure they are and were created. We were created to please God. Brothers, this is Christ. Are you doing it? 
Or you've fallen into the trap of trying to get along with this world. Pleasing the world. Pleasing family. Pleasing wives. Pleasing husbands. Pleasing sons. Daughters. Family. Like extended family. Friends. Co-workers. And so on and so on and so on. We were created to please God. What ultimately pleases God? We read about the fear of the Lord as the beginning of wisdom, and the end is doing His commandments. Ecclesiastes 12, 13. They also hate it when these, these false converts, false Christianity you see out there, they hate it when I quote this. The book of Ecclesiastes, the preacher. Ecclesiastes 12, 13. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. We were just reading... Ecclesiastes, he that made everything beautiful in his time also he hath set the world in their own hearts so that no man can find out the work of God that maketh from the beginning to the end. To everything there is a season and time and purpose under the sun, or under heaven, sorry. Time to be born, a time to die, a time to plant. Time, he goes through all of life. But what are we getting right here? He's, he's summing it all up. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep His commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. The whole duty of man. What's the first commandment we have for today? Obey the gospel. It's not the last, but it's the first. It's how we get saved and born again, obeying the gospel. Repentance towards God. Godly sorrow in your heart for your personal sins that you've sinned against Him. Coming to Him with a broken heart and a contrite spirit. Because that's the only type of person God saves. It says so in the Bible. In the book of Psalms. And time and time again, people are asking God to save them. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Repentance. True biblical repentance. Believing in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. That it was God's blood that was shed on the cross. And that He paid the price that you should have paid. And that His blood can wash your sins away because it's God the Father's blood. Jesus is God the Father manifest in the flesh. You confess both in prayer. That broken heart. That sorrow for your sinning against God. And what Jesus Christ did for you. That He is God. That He was buried and He rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Proving that He's God. And then you ask God to save you. That's the first commandment. That's not the only commandment we have today. That was, our, that was my first commandment. When I turned and gave God my life at the cross, at Calvary, I threw the old man at the foot of the cross. Ye are my friends if you do whatsoever I command you. Remember he says there's no greater love than this, than a man lay down his life for his friend. Ye are my friends if you do whatsoever I command you. Ye are my friends. What's he saying there? Those who gave, those who gave their life to Jesus Christ at the cross. What's the evidence? That's the beginning. What's the end? They do His commandments. You are my friends if you do whatsoever I command you. This is the whole duty of man. Salvation is the first command. Then you start going through and you read the Pauline epistles. You start reading the whole Bible for instruction and in righteousness. And God starts teaching you how to live. What pleases Him. And we've already talked about some of them. Love not the world. That's a command. Love not the world. Be not conformed to the world. That's a command. Abstain from all appearance of evil. That's a command. Pray without ceasing. That's a command. And it says up there, His praise endureth forever. We praise God for Him. You can always tell these false converts because they don't like it when God's given the commands. They don't like it when God's telling them what to do. They are their own lowercase g God. They do what they want to do. Or what they, they will, they're willing to sacrifice. We're supposed to be a living sacrifice. We're supposed to sacrifice it all, brothers and Christ. We gave our whole life to Jesus Christ. Not just what we've, we... I can afford to lose this, or I can afford to... We gave our whole selves to Jesus Christ at the foot of the cross. It's the whole duty of man. God is giving commands after salvation, and we're to follow them. They're not suggestions. Put on the whole armor of God. That's a command. Not a suggestion. Right? Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep His commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. In Luke 8.21 we read, Luke 8.21, Jesus is talking, And He answered and said unto them, My mother and my brethren are these which hear the word of God and do it. 
The end is more important than the beginning. Are you living a life of Christ? Remember I told you, when you're lost, that's the beginning. Found, it's the end when it comes to salvation. Eternal salvation. Then Paul starts talking about salvation in this life as a saved sinner. Paul starts talking about the judgment seat of Christ and earning rewards and that, hey, you need to still fear God. Well, I don't have to fear God. I, I, I gave my life to Him at the cross. I don't have to fear. We still need to fear God. Why? Because we're going to have to stand before Him someday and give an account for our life as a Christian. We're going to have to stand before Him at the judgment seat of Christ. Read Revelation. John, the disciple whom Jesus loved, when he saw Jesus Christ right before him, what did he do? Oh, I don't have to fear nothing. You know, he's my best pal. Let's do that secret handshake. Let's hug. Let's give a high five. That's my homeboy. That's how I was when I was lost with these false religions, calling God my homeboy. Lord, have mercy on me. Is that how John acted? No. What did John do? He fell on his face as if he were dead. The fear of the Lord came upon him and he fell on his face as if he was dead. People think they're going to be able to handle that judgment seat of Christ, no problem. I'm going to walk in there and it's not going to be a problem. Oh no. I believe everyone that steps up there is going to have fear. And I pray everyone that steps up there falls on their face before God and says, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. Lord, have mercy on me. Brothers, this is Christ. Now is the beginning of, of uh, we got saved, salvation, this life. It, we're at the beginning. The end is when we get called home. In life or in death. Are you focused on that end? A lot of brethren are getting so distracted by the world and worldliness, you're forgetting that. My mother and my brethren are they which hear the word of God and do it. It's not enough just to hear it. You got to do it. It's not enough to have the talk, because you come across a lot of those online. You have a lot of talkers online. Talk, 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 talk. They're all talk. What about their walk? That's why I'm, 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 I'm really getting burnt out on the online, so-called online Christianity. It's no different than the Babel buildings. The YouTube online Christianity is starting to really weigh heavy on me, brothers of Christ. It's no different than the Babel building system. It's all talk. You don't really see how the brethren are living. You don't see, you know, the, the person, if you have two people there, one that's truly saved, one that's a wolf in sheep's clothing, you're supposed to ju uh, judge them by their works and how they're living their life of Christ and what they're really standing for and what they do. But you can't see that online. You, it's so hard to tell truth, uh, or not truth from error, but those who are real versus those that are fake. Okay? And a lot of things that we fled, we got away from the battle building system because they were inviting lost people in. You couldn't de determine lost from saved. And it became a social club. Not fellowship, but social club. And they started watering down the word of God. They started watering down the gospel. We wanted to come here for truth. And you can still get some good preaching online. But that fellowship, okay, being able to see the works, you don't get to see the works. Man, I digress again. Sorry, for, but it's just been eating at me. Maybe I'm the only one. Maybe I'm the only one. It's just been eating at me that we need to get back to trying to do house churches or some kind of meeting where we all come together, whether it's in the woods, the park, someone's home, where we actually come together and we're there helping one another out physically and spiritually and holding each other accountable to this book and the life that we're living for Jesus Christ. I can tell you what the book says, but I don't know what's going to help you because I don't see the life you're actually living. God does. Sometimes God will have me hit something just right for you or for this brother or for that sister. But, but this is Christ. It's doing. We need to be living a life of Christ. And no matter what's going on in the world. James 1.22 says, James chapter 1 verse 22 it says, but be ye doers of the word and not hearers only. It's great to do Bible studies. Bible studies are great. Listening to this Bible study, I pray you have your Bible open, you're pausing, you're turning, you're following along. Hearing the word of God. But if you're not taking what I'm telling you and hiding it in your heart and applying it to your life, I need to start living for Jesus Christ. 
I need to start doing what's right. I need to preach the gospel more. I need to hand out gospel tracts more. God has opened doors and I've been hiding and I need to start going through those open doors. I need to start being a living witness. Be doers of the word and not hearers only. Deceiving your own selves. I'm going to bring it back to the false converts, the easy believism. Deceiving your own selves. They're hearers of the word. They have the knowledge of why Jesus died, what he went through, and why he went through it. They have the knowledge, they're hearers, but they don't obey the gospel. They refuse to come to God broken. Yeah, I'm a sinner, you're a sinner, we're all sinners. So what? Nah, I'll just believe in the big guy upstairs. No reverence for Jesus Christ, no fear of God, no sorrow. Deceiving your own selves. For, it, for if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like unto a man beholding his natural face in the glass. And you can keep reading it. Now remember James, I believe James is for the time of Jacob's trouble. It's very important to not just be a hearer of the word, but a doer of the word when it comes to the fact that in the time of Jacob's trouble, there's faith and works. But for instruction righteous today, evidence that you're actually hiding the Word of God in your heart is that you're living it. You're a doer of the Word. It's evidence, instruction, and righteousness. Some of us fail God. I have. Where I stopped hiding God's Word in my heart and my life reflected, the choices of my life reflected that I was starting to do things the flesh's way, the world's way. And not intentionally, but... Oftentimes, the world's way, who's the lowercase g, God of this world? Satan. You end up, you catch yourself, wait a minute, that's Satan's way. Why am I trying to do something Satan's way? And God gets you back on the right path. Okay. I'm not saying I'm perfect, but our heartfelt desire is to take God's word in our heart and to live God's way. To be doers of the word, not just hearers of the word. Matthew 21, 28. Matthew 21, 28. Chapter 21, verse 28. But what think ye? A certain man had two sons. Here's another parable. Had two sons that talk about beginning and end. Beginning and end. A certain man had two sons, and he came to the first and said, Son, go work today in my vineyard. He answered and said, I will not. Beginning. But afterward... He repented, had sorrow in his heart for telling his father, no, I will not. And the evidence of that repentance and went, the end. So the beginning, I will not go, the end, he went. Verse 30, and he came to the second and said, likewise. And he answered and said, I go, sir. I'll go, I'll go, sir. No repentance. You say, what, what, what does he need repentance for? Because of this. And went not. He didn't go at all. You can tell by him not going and saying, I, was, I will go, but doesn't go. There's no sorrow in his heart for how he treats his father. Lying to his father? Eh, not a big deal. Not a big deal. No sorrow in his heart. Whether then twain did the will of his father, they say unto him, the first. The man that said, I won't go, but in the end he, he went. Brothers and sisters Christ, we have testimony of testimony where we fought God, I fought God. God, I believe God was trying to call me to salvation many a time throughout my life. And I kept saying, I will not go, I will not go, I will not go. But there came a point in my life where I repented and I obeyed the gospel. And now I belong to Jesus Christ. I am in Christ Jesus. Paul talks about how your body is not your own. You were bought with a price. Feed the church of God with his purchase with his own blood. I belong to God. I am his. Lord, command me. Tell me how I'm supposed to live. You have all these fakes and these frauds out there, brother, says Christ, that Oh yeah, I go. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, I believe. I believe. It's head knowledge. But oh yeah, I believe. But they refuse to repent. They refuse to come to God broken. With a broken heart and a contrite spirit. I've talked about them. They love using the cross as a credit card. Swiping the card. 
I'll just put my sin, I'll just continue in sin and wickedness, even though Paul says, are we to contend you in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How are we that are dead to sin live any longer in? But they have that attitude, and I did. I, I'm taking from experience. I can point my finger at them, but now I'm pointing the finger at me. When I was a false convert, that was my life, brothers and Christ. Nothing but sin and wickedness, and any time it got brought up, I got told, don't worry, it's under the cross. Don't worry, God's, God will forgive you. Don't worry, His, His blood will wash your sins away. It's all head knowledge. They were saying things that were true. Don't get me wrong. The Bible says if we confess our sins, God is faithful to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But they didn't come to God broken. They didn't fear God, and they weren't coming to God broken. They were coming to Him in pride, the pride of life. Nah, just treating it like a credit card. Nah. That's these people here that say, oh yeah, I'll go. They have the head knowledge, but they never go to the cross. They never actually make it to Calvary. They just, they just have the knowledge of Calvary. I'll say it like that. They have the knowledge of Calvary. Why Jesus died, you know, who, what he went through and everything, but they never actually make it there. They don't go. They never come and fall on their knees before the cross, before God Almighty, and throw the old man at the foot of the cross in repentance. I'm yours, Lord. Take me, I'm yours. Nothing in my hands I bring, simply to thy cross I cling. Take me, Lord, I'm yours. It's not about doing works to be saved, it's about giving your life to Jesus Christ. Paul, Jesus talks about um, being in his hand and being in the Father's hand. No man can take him out of my Father's hand, and no man can take him out of my hand. I and my Father are one. I know it's a Godhead verse, but the point is, is you say, Lord, I want my life to be in your hands. I'm yours. Take this wicked man. And God goes, I'll take him, and I'll give you a new man. You'll be a new man, a new creature in Christ Jesus. I'll give you a new birth. I'll give you a new life. You get to start over. Romans chapter 10, verse 16. Romans chapter 10, verse 16. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah saith, Lord, who hath believed our report? But they have not, I want to re-quote that verse, they have not all obeyed the gospel. These easy believism, these false Christianity, you see this just swarming all over America and most of the world today, because we're getting towards the end. They, oh, we don't have to obey nothing. That's works. That's works. You don't have to, we don't have to come to repent. That's works. We don't have to pray. That's works. They won't go to the cross. They won't go to Calvary. They say they will, but they won't go. They won't come to God broken. They won't obey the gospel. Repentance towards God, faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. Confess both in prayer and ask God to save them. They won't do all of it. They just have the head belief. They have the knowledge. They've been told what to do. But they won't do it. They won't go. Romans 10, 13. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him on whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace. Not pride, not anger, not hate, not bitterness. The gospel of peace. I've always said, when I'm trying to preach the true plan of salvation, a lot of these easy believism, they come back to me with so much hate and bitterness. You see the anger, the hate, the bitterness. They're preaching a false gospel, and I come to them preaching a false gospel. I don't come to them in pride, ego, bitterness, and hate. I come to them saying, here's the truth. I want to see you get saved. Here's the truth. Here's the true plan of salvation you were lied to. I was lied to. Here's how to get saved. I preach the gospel of peace. I'm not there to fight them. I'm not your enemy. 
You know, the word friend oftentimes will be spoken of when you used to be spoken of, not that we're best friends, that we know each other and we, we grew up together and everything. The Bible talks about a friend that's closer than a brother. There's times where there's that kind of friend that's like your best friend. You grew up together, you, do, you, did, you would go fishing and you spend a lot of time together, you're best friends. But oftentimes the word friend, it just simply means I'm not your enemy. That's why people would say, hey, f hello, friend. When you heard someone coming, you, you start getting your weapons. You don't know who he is. Is he going to rob you? Is he going to attack you? And he'd always say, whoa, friend, how is your day going? They don't know each other. But when they say friend, it's their way of saying, hey, I'm not your enemy. Okay? The gospel of peace. And bring glad tidings of good things. There's an exclamation point there of good things. The true plan of salvation is a good thing. And we're supposed to have the attitude that this is great. I'm trying to witness to you. This is great. This is what you need. And we do it in meekness. The gospel of peace. But these guys get these easy beliefs and, and false religions. Jehovah's Witness, Mormons, they, Catholics, they get so riled up you can just see the hate in them. The hate for God's word. The hate for the true plan of salvation. It starts with repentance, then belief in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross, confess both in prayer, and the final step is calling upon the Lord to save you. But the main part there we're talking about is preaching the gospel of peace. Amen. Preaching the gospel of peace. Brothers, I might be getting ahead of myself, but the Bible says in meekness, in meekness instructing those that oppose themselves. When we go out and we see people's beginnings... And we're telling them how, they, how their end is going to be. Cast them into outer darkness. They should be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Talking about the lake of fire. Talks about hell. And then getting tossed in the lake of fire. Death and hell were cast in the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever is not found written in the book of life is cast in the lake of fire. We talk about their beginning. How they're dirty, rotten, filthy, low down, no good sinners. They've broken the, the law of sin and death. The Levitical. The laws that God set, you've sinned against God, and the punishment is hell. We talk about their end. And then we talk about what Jesus Christ did. Because of their beginning, because of their sin and wickedness, what Jesus Christ had to go through. You witness to people, in meekness instructing those that oppose themselves, we want to see people get saved. And I guess I'm pleading with the brethren to get back to that, you know, when you first got saved, you, got, you had that... Faith as a child and that love for the gospel that you just, you just had this happiness to want to see people get saved. And I know that a lot of you, we tried to witness, uh, myself, tried to witness to some people. We had such a great attitude and the lost world loves to take away our joy in the gospel. They really like to beat us down to where we're just like, uh, and we just sat there. We need to get back to that joy for the gospel. We need to get back to getting out there and gospel tracting, gospel tracting and witnessing for Jesus Christ. And we need to do it in meekness, humbleness, in peace, being peaceful. They can be all riled up. They can be angry. They can be hateful. They can be all... We need to be peaceful. Mm -hmm. And Psalms 119.11 uh, and Psalms 119.9. Psalms, Psalms 119. When I quoted, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee, you find that in Psalms 119.11. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way by taking heed thereto according to thy words? Psalms 119.9. We're supposed to be set apart from this world. So the first witness the world gets is how you live your life. What you're doing. Not your words, but your works. Then it's your words. Yeah. And Jesus said, uh, John 14.15, if, if you love me, keep my commandments. We're going back to the life of a Christian. I'm sorry, I'm kind of bounce around with preaching the gospel and the life of a Christian. But the life of a Christian is a living witness for Jesus Christ. How we live. How we keep separate from the world. We need to go back to loving, living God's way. Don't let the world get you down. Don't let them beat you down. Don't compromise. Don't conform to this world. Don't love the world. There are brethren that are starting to love the world more than they love God. They love their wives more than they love God. Or their husbands. They love their children more than they love God. They love things of this world more than they love God. 
Love not the world, they are the things in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. We need to go back to living God's way and doing things God's way and loving God's way. If you love me, keep my commandments. John 14, 15. John 14, 23 says, Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and will come unto him and make our abode with him. We talked about God's word. We started with God's word. Talking about the beginning versus the end. The beginning, I didn't care about God's word. I cared about man's word. My word, the world's word, Satan's word. Those were the three dominant words that were the authority in my life as a lost professing Christian. A false convert. But even before I even got saved, it was that way. After you get saved, what happens? The end. God's word's what matters. His commandment's what matters. Did you obey the gospel? Yes, I, you say, yes, I obeyed the gospel, brother. I obeyed the gospel, brother. Well, praise God. Are you living a life of Christ now? That's, now you've got a new beginning. You've got a new life. You're a new creature in Christ Jesus. How's your walk with the Lord going? How's your life of Christ going? Are you, do you find yourself living for Him more and more every day? Or do you find yourself getting distracted more and more every day? Falling away more and more every day? John 14, 23, Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. What motivates us to, to please God and to keep his commandments? Because that's what pleases God, fearing the Lord. A lot of people say, well, I fear God. Are you keeping his commandments? What does that have to do with it? It's evidence of fearing God. Do you love God? Oh yeah, I love God. I love Jesus Christ. Are you keeping his word? That's works based on, I don't know what you're talking about. Blah, blah, blah. You don't love God. Why? Because the evidence, the beginning, love God. The end, you keep his word. And the end, or the beginning is defined by the end. If I read that right, I kind of want to make sure I quoted that verse right. Declaring the end from the beginning. Okay. You declare the end from the beginning. You fear God. Why? Because the evidence is you're keeping His commandments. Oh, I love Jesus. The evidence is that you're keeping His word. Mm -hmm. Just like that prodigal son, I go not. But he went in the end. He had repentance and sorrow. He went in the end. He loved his father. He showed real love for his father and fearing his father. Because he went in the end. The one guy that said, I'll go, and then didn't go at all, he didn't love his father, and he didn't fear his father. He can say, he can say with his words, oh no, I love my father, oh no, I loved him, I loved him, I loved him. His deeds show that he didn't love his father. It's that simple. Brothers, this is Christ, 2 Corinthians 6, 2, we quote this a lot. For he saith, I have heard thee in a time accepted, in the day of salvation have I succored thee. Behold, now is the accepted time, behold, now is the day of salvation. We talk about that verse, that today it's, we get saved, we get born again. It's so important to preach the gospel, to see people get saved. We probably won't see many get saved in these last days, but we, our heartfelt desire is to see people get saved. But I'm here to tell you, brothers, this is Christ, that after you get saved, now is the day. Talk about salvation in this life. Now is the day to start living for Jesus Christ. Now is the day to start doing what's right by the Lord. Right? Get back to fearing Him and doing things His way. Now, 2 Thessalonians 2, 3, what we're seeing today, and it's going to get into another study that we're going to get into, but 2 Thessalonians 2, 3 says, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first. And that man's sin be revealed, the son of perdition. There's been falling away from Paul's time to today, where brethren get saved, and then they start going back into the world. They start getting back into the flesh. They start getting back into the world with compromise and loving the world. And they start making a mess of their walk with the Lord. And their life really doesn't amount to much as a Christian. But Paul's talking about in the last days, there's, when he's talking about this, he's talking about a falling away that sticks out. Some people, I don't want to add to the Word of God because some people call it the great falling away. The Bible doesn't say great. But Paul is pointing something out saying, this is going to stick out. Today we've seen a huge, a whole world of professing Christians 
that don't line up with this book, that attack this book at any cost. And it's gotten so bad that you have people who profess to be King James Bible believers, and yet they attack the true plan of salvation. The Romans rode to hell. The Romans rode to hell. Those are servants of Satan. Mm -hmm. Are we in the falling away where this? I believe this is talking about the man of sin's about to be revealed any day now. I'm looking for that blessed hope, not the man of sin. I'm looking for that blessed hope like we're supposed to. I'm living every day for Jesus Christ. Making sure that my life pleases Him and I'm living right. And I'm always ready to be a living and a verbal witness for Jesus Christ to see other people get saved. If you're falling away from stands you used to take for the Lord, it is not too late to get back up and stand. And we're really going to get into that in this next question that someone asked. But I was doing these notes and I was kind of throwing little things in there to encourage you guys. Ephesians 6.13 Wherefore take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. Brothers and Christ, don't forget to put on the whole armor of God. And when you read about it, the whole armor of God is basically taking God's word and hiding it in your heart and living it. And keeping your eyes on what matter. That blessed hope. The helmet for a hope of salvation. That blessed hope. The breastplate of righteousness. You read, okay, I belong to Jesus Christ. I'm a representative of Jesus Christ. An ambassador, the Bible says, an ambassador for Jesus Christ. I've been given the ministry of reconciliation. I'm supposed to be a living witness and a verbal witness. Okay? I'm supposed to be a good representation. Jesus says do this, I do it. If I fight him a little bit at first, make sure your end is that you're doing it. You're not one of those people that say, I go and then don't go. That isn't, that's not a good representation of Jesus Christ, that breastplate of righteousness. Um, you have the feet shod with the preparation of peace. Always be ready to preach the gospel, but do it in meekness. And be peaceful about it. I'm just here to preach the truth to you. And if they don't want it, let them alone. You try planting seeds, let them alone. They be blind leaders of the blind. Let the blind lead the blind, they both shall fall in a ditch. Brush the dust off your feet and move on to the next city. But be peaceful about it. Don't get all bitter and, and, and start taking things per These People are lost like we used to be, brothers and sisters of Christ. Don't take it so personal. Say, Lord, brush the dust off your feet. Praise God that he gave you an opportunity to preach the gospel. And you move on to somebody else. And what we're doing is we're seeking people who want truth. We're seeking people that have hit that point where they have a broken heart and a contrite spirit. We're seeking those that want to get saved, that need to get saved. Well, everyone needs to get saved, but you know what I'm saying? They're, they're at the point where they're ready. God, God looks at the heart. We don't. So God tells us we're always supposed to be ready to give an answer. Paul says, always be ready to give an answer for the hope that is in you. That hope, that blessed hope, salvation. Living a life of Christ. Why do you live that way? Because I please God. God watches over me. God takes care of us. Mm -hmm. But Christ, there's a big falling away today. People are forgetting the beginning because they're being told the beginning doesn't matter anymore. I look at how I was before I got saved and I look at how I am now that I'm saved, that God saved me after salvation, and I still to this day will sit there in my prayers and say, God, thank you. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for everything you've given me. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for giving me your perfect written word. Thank you for opening the scriptures and teaching me how to hide it in my heart and live it. I'm still thanking God for saving me to this very day. I've been saved for almost 10 years now, and I'm still to this day thanking Him. And you've got some people out there that I don't believe they're saved, they just take it for granted, and they don't thank God for salvation. And their life that they're living doesn't show that they're thanking God for salvation. Remember, it's not just in words, it's also in deeds. Someone says something, beginning, what's the end? Their actions. Do their actions back up what they're saying? Remember the man, the parable, I go, and then he didn't go. His actions were different than his words. 1 John 1, 9, remember, brothers and sisters Christ, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It's not too late to turn around. We're going to hit this harder in this other study. Really bring it home. The falling away that we really desperately need to repent. 
and believe the end is more important than the beginning. How you end. I pray this. We're going to end it here. I'm going to pray this for the brethren that what I always pray for myself, brothers says Christ, is that there's times where I fall flat on my face. I forget some of the things that uh, just temporarily, it just seems like, because I look back and go, how could I have done that? The only way is I forgot these things. I got distracted by the flesh, the world, Satan, attacks from the enemy. But brothers of Christ, I pray that I all the time said, Lord, when you come back, that find me standing in a standing position. The Bible talks about having done all to stand when it talks about putting on the whole armor of God. Why? So you can be standing when God comes and calls us home. Whether he calls you home in life or he calls you home in death, that you're standing and not falling flat on your face. The Bible talks about don't faint, don't falter. I don't want God coming back and finding me fainting and faltering. I don't want God coming back and finding me falling flat on my face, just failing him. We've talked about this in other studies. When I walk up there in fear and I fall with my face to the ground at the judgment seat of cross before judgment seat of Christ before Jesus Christ, who is the judge, and my works get thrown on the fire to be burnt up, I don't want him giving me a penny saying, I'm just so disappointed in you. Just so disappointed in you. Yeah, next. Just so disappointed in you. I want him to say, Well done, thou good and faithful one. You struggled, you had hardship, you struggled with the flesh, praise God, not giving in and just giving up, because I believe, like I said, some brethren seem like they've given in and they've given up. Not just get, struggling with the flesh, struggling with the world, putting on the whole armor of God so you can stand against the wiles of the devil, fighting and struggling against Satan. God's going to, I want him to say, well done, thou good and faithful one. Does it, don't you, brothers and sisters, Christ? The end is more important than the beginning. Right now, right here, right now, if you're falling flat on your face, come to God in prayer. Get back into this book, because chances, I, I, I say chances, but I'd say saying the facts are that you're not even in this book if you're really falling flat on your face that much. Watching it and listening to somebody else read it isn't the same as you actually reading it and talking with the Lord one-on-one, -on -one, going through the Bible with the Lord one-on-one, -on -one, just you and Him. Get back in this book, get back into prayer, get back into applying what God has shown you to your life. Repentance starts at salvation. Before God saves you, we call it at salvation, but it comes before God saves you. It starts at the plan of salvation, and it continues in your life as a Christian, clear until Jesus Christ calls us home. It's not too late. Get back up, get back to standing, get back to living for the Lord, get, get on fire for the gospel, get back on fire for reading the Word of God and listening to the Word of God. Alexander Scorby, you can listen to that while you're working. I listen to it gardening. I listen to it when I'm house, cleaning house. I listen to it out on the deck. I listen to it in the car when I make trips. I live outside town a little bit, so I listen to it. I, I listen to God's Word a lot. I'm getting back into my love for the Word of God. And what hinders this? Is the flesh when you start getting into the world. Start getting into the flesh, getting into sin. You start getting into the world, compromising or getting fearful of the world, getting distracted by what's going on in the world. Compromising and, and doing things Satan's way with these Babel buildings. They're all doing a lot of things Satan's way. They're not doing things God's way. There's a lot of things, look, brothers and Christ, you can get back up and get back on fire for the Lord and His Word and prayer and living for Him. Time is running out, not just for salvation, but I believe the time is running out for us winning, yeah, not winning, earning rewards in heaven. Pleasing God, living a life. Time is running out, brothers and sisters. We can get called home any day now. So I'm going to end this with grace and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all and my love for you, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Thank you for watching. Get back in the book, brothers and sisters. Christ, get back in the book. Begin your day, I didn't say this real quick, begin your day with the Word of God and end your day with the Word of God. Everything that has a beginning has an end. I know that the, that sounds, I think it was in a movie, I know it sounds like I'm still, but they, the, the world tends to steal from the Bible. The world does. The Bible talks about that there's beginnings, there's ends. 
Begin your day with the Word of God. End your day with the Word of God. I love you, brothers and sisters Christ, and I'm praying for you. Please pray for this ministry. And please pray for me just as a brother in Christ. Brothers and sisters Christ. And I'll see you in the next video.